yes, welcome to this fourth session of the Engineers Without Borders UK's Constructive Con Conversations series. Um, my name's Joe Mulligan, and I'm going to be chairing the session this evening. I just want to check um, as we start that um, people are hearing me clearly. Maybe I could just get a thumbs up from Emma. Thank you very much, Emma. And yeah, you are highly welcome. I think we'll we'll get started and uh, a few more people may join us, but we have a great group here already. Thanks so much for spending your, your evening uh, and day with us, depending on where you are. Wonderful. So the intention for these events is to provide a space to discuss, challenge, listen to some of the most pressing issues that we need to interrogate to put global responsibility at the heart of engineering. And uh, as I said, my name's Joe, a, a little bit on my, my uh, background. I'm a civil engineer and director of a non-profit design and community development organization called KDI. And I've been involved with EWB since 2004 in various uh, guises. And um, I'm one of the organization's change makers. And joining you tonight from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, um, from the Division of Strategic Sustainability Studies, where I'm also an affiliated researcher. So super happy to be here. I'll say a little bit more about the session and the wonderful folk that you're going to hear from and, and get into conversation with tonight. So the agenda for the event, we are gonna be talking about how engineers can not only reduce the impact of their work, but also restore and regenerate ecological systems. We're gonna have a, a, fan, a panel discussion with three fantastic speakers from different areas of engineering and environmental practice. And they will share their insights and experience connected to regenerative engineering. Following that, we'll have a interactive breakout session where we'll go into smaller groups and have a bit more of a, a, a back and forth about how all of us can put the, the principle of regeneration into action in our work. And this conversation really picks up on EWB's 2021 to 2030 strategy which is all about how engineering can contribute to achieving social and environmental justice. Um, the, the 2021 to 2030 strategy sets out four key principles for globally responsible engineering. And uh, I think we ha should have them on the screen here. Yes, wonderful. So uh, for those of you who, are, who, who don't know the, the strategy off by heart, I'll just uh, go through these four principles. The first is responsible, meeting the needs of all people within the limits of the biosphere uh, of our planet. They should be fundamentally at the heart of engineering. Purposeful, to consider all the impacts of engineering from a project or products inception through to the end of its life uh, from a global and local scale, a kind of life cycle perspective. Number three, inclusive, to ensure that diverse viewpoints and knowledge are included and respected in the engineering process. And number four, the one we're gonna be talking about tonight, regenerative, to actively restore and regenerate ecological systems rather than just reducing impact. So this discussion and this, this principle feels particularly pertinent to me in the aftermath of the COP26 process and declaration and of all the many things said and discussed and um, it would take too long to unpack them all. Uh, but one big uh, talking point 
I think that relates to this conversation has been a disconnect between the discussion on action on mitigating climate change and secondly, the need to protect and enhance biodiversity, which of course is also subject to a completely separate uh, COP process, also housed within the UN system. And, and, and really that, that second piece is, that's the basis for all life systems on earth. So there has to be, there has to be a connection between those conversations. And as we talk about mitigation and adaptation, we also need to be talking about uh, protection, conservation, and regeneration. These all need to be linked. And I believe that engineers at their best can be those systems integrators that put those things together and can help radically transform how we, how we, uh, how we live uh, to make life viable for people and the planet. So that's um, mostly what I'm gonna say about it. You're gonna be hearing now from an awesome set of panelists who are actually from really different areas of environment and engineering practice, working in different scales, disciplines and geographies. And, uh, and, and as we'll see, I think regeneration can mean different things to, to different people in different places. Uh, but we want to try and make some connections between those experiences. And uh, we also want to hear from you all. We really want this to be an open conversation. Uh, I'm going to be asking some, some, some questions to the panel, but we want to bring you in. Um, so have your questions ready and, and put them in the chat as we go. And we'll try and bring those into the conversation. And also we want you to think about, you know, what, what could this regenerative principle mean to you uh, in your work? Wonderful. So let me introduce these three wonderful people who I've had the chance to, to chat to in, in recent days. Um, firstly, I will introduce Olivia Sweeney. Olivia is an environmentalist and one of Bristol's Black and Green Ambassadors, which is a project that explores the intersection of climate and racial justice by connecting and celebrating diverse community action for the environment. Olivia has a particular interest in clean air for all and is working on a project building community solutions for clean air. As part of this, she and two other ambassadors have a monthly show on Ujima Radio. She also works as a junior consultant at Resource Futures, a sustainable waste consultancy working to make it easier for people to reduce their waste, recycle and build the circular economy. She previously worked for Lush, Cosmetics, where she learned the valuable link between global and local planning and action, and the balance between innovative solutions and learning building on our culture and history. She was named one of the top 100 most influential women in engineering by the Financial Times in 2019, and is an advocate for diversity and equity in all forms. Joining us this evening from mighty Bristol. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Next, we have Diego Almandrades. Diego is an engineer and social entrepreneur with a passion for holistic management and ecosystem restoration in the dry forest of Peru. He has 10 years of experience in creation and management of sustainability projects with communities, stakeholders, and international agencies. He co-founded the, the social enterprise Ecoswell in rural Northern Peru, where he lives and leads projects in ecotourism, biodiversity conservation, groundwater, and regenerative agriculture. And Diego is calling in this evening from Peru. Welcome, Diego, very much. Good. Thank you, Thank you Joe. And thank you, everyone at Engineers Without Borders UK. Glad to be here. Super. Last but not least is Dan Smith. Dan is a chartered environmentalist working with Royal Skoning DHV Digital. 
He is a recovering engineer and a graduate of the MPhil in Engineering for Sustainable Development. And he spends his time translating between engineering, environmental and software sectors to enable digital innovation for sustainable development. He's currently leading the development of an environmental consent assurance product in collaboration with a major European offshore wind developer. And Dan has over 10 years of international experience, which includes river restoration, environmental impact assessment, exploration of innovative partnerships to drive environmental benefit, and now software development as well. He's fascinated with how exponential technology can enable investment at the scale needed to create resilient socio-ecological systems. Welcome to Dan, who is calling in from the Netherlands, I believe. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Good to be Wonderful. Here. Cheers. Good. So uh, we, we're going to hear more from the panelists now. Um, and what I would ask of the audience is that you, you um, stay on mute for the duration of the panel discussion. Um, however, do feel free to add thoughts and questions in the chat box. And uh, myself and the, the team at EWB will keep an eye on the chat through the session. And we want to, to bring the, your questions in to help steer today's conversation. So yeah, just get, get chatting away. And if people are comfortable, uh, happy and interested to, to um, turn on their mics and, and speak up as well and, and ask questions directly, you are very, very welcome to. But what I'll do is, is start with a, with a few questions so you can get to know our super panelists um, a bit more. And yeah, as I said a bit earlier on, we'll, we'll talk um, for around 45 minutes and then we, uh, we'll, we'll go into breakout rooms after that. Okay, great, enough from me. I'm gonna turn it over to, to the panelists. I'll start with a, with a question for you, uh, Olivia. And um, it's, it's really exciting to, to have a chemical engineer on this panel and in this conversation. And I was gonna ask you, uh, and of course, an environmentalist. And so I wanted to ask you a bit about your, your journey in studying uh, chemical engineering and how you've been able to put those skill sets together in, in service of your work on environment and on sustainability. So. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so I chose to study chemical engineering without really knowing what it was. So I don't come from a family of engineers um, or anything like that. So for me, um, I've always been interested in greenness and sustainability, whatever that kind of means. And I think my definition of those things have evolved as I've grown up um, and, and understood what it means. And I found chemical engineering when I was looking for university through university prospectuses. And for me, it felt like it was something that gave me the skills to make a tangible change um, within the sustainable field. And also if I had a drastic change of heart and just didn't care anymore, it was a useful degree to have um, for other things. Um, so the original plan when I was 18 and I chose chemical engineering, um, I wanted to go into renewable energy development. Um, so in, I'm assuming as we're engineers at that borders, a lot of chemical engineers end up going into the fossil fuel industry. Um, so I had a plan of either doing my own thing on the outside, so working for like a green development, a green energy development company, or working from within to make that change. So um, working for somebody like Shell or BP and working within the, their green arm, but then Throughout my degree, um, as much as I could, I customized that to learn what was relevant in my, from my perspective for that sustainable stuff. But even in seeking that out, it was still really hard to achieve and there wasn't enough of that. And it was very much um, from a disconnected perspective. So we, you know, we've been talking about the connection with nature and the understanding of that. And that's not how I was taught engineering, at least. I don't know about everyone else. There wasn't that element of, it was more about reduction of emissions from purely 
um, quantitative perspective um, and like like you said at the beginning, minimizing impact as opposed to um, trying to do something positive. So by the time I graduated, um, I'd done internships in places like Romania, um, Pakistan, and I actually did my my master's out in Sweden looking at biofuel because that again, kind of I was in that energy sphere, but on graduating, um, my morals kicked in and I couldn't bring myself to work for somebody like Shell or BP, even though, you know, if they change their mind, the impact they have would massive. And I could, you know, you could, you'd be working for a big company where you had kind of the money and the resource to maybe make those big changes. I just couldn't do it from a personal perspective. So I did all the graduate scheme applying and it just didn't feel right. So I started looking for companies that had both the ethics, um, which I think we forget when we talk about um, working in the sustainability space, that ethics don't necess aren't necessarily implicit when you say, oh, somebody's sustainable. That doesn't necessarily mean they're ethical. So I think that was really important for me that I worked for a company that had the ethics um, and the environmental standards that I, I wanted. And it wasn't just an add-on, which I only graduated four years ago. Um, and this space has shifted a lot in that time. Um, but with companies, you know, like the classics for chemical engineers, Shell and BP, ethics are slim to none, but even the environmental stuff is very much an add-on. It's not at the core. So I chose to work for Lush, which in case you don't know, is a um, British cosmetics company that very much has ethics and environment at its core of the design of the company, um, and the processes. Um, so it hasn't been shoehorned in at the end. And I was looking after aroma chemicals. So I was using um, my chemical engineering skills, both the chemistry of aroma and fragrance, but also that kind of mass production element of things and, and the scaling of processes. Um, but in a field that I definitely wasn't taught was part of chemical engineering. Um, and also something that I'd never really considered how, how you know, fragrance making could be sustainable. And that kind of opened everything up from there. And I'll stop talking because I've probably answered this question too long. Um, uh, but, you know, fundamentally, engineering is about problem solving. And that is how I've used I've used um, what I learned as a chemical engineer. I might not be resizing heat exchangers with a lot of what you do in your undergraduate, but I'm still using those core principles um, now. Super. That's that's brilliant, Olivia. And um good to 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 hear how those problem solving skills have carried through to all these these exciting things you've been doing and uh and good to, to hear that the morals got in there early on as well and uh um i think that's that ethical component is is really important wonderful so i'll i'll, I'll turn to diego now and um diego i think as as everyone in this this panel really you, you know you're all so um, interdisciplinary in, in different ways, whether it's different positions you've taken or the integration um, of disciplines in your in your organizations as well. And I think that your organization Ecoswell is fascinating because it, as I understand it, it brings together the kind of environmental science, engineering, business, local knowledge uh, is fundamental throughout all of those from what I've seen of your work. So I think it would be super interesting for the folk here to hear a little bit about the story of Ecoswell, how it came about, and then what are the, how do you actually bring together those different perspectives and perspectives and knowledge um, bases, uh, you know, together in a real uh, project like the ones that you were doing in the north of Peru? Yes, thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so a bit on um, the story of Ecoswell. Um, we founded it with uh, the belief and the assurance that people and nature um, can, uh, must, and will thrive uh, unison if there is a future um, for humanity in this world. Um, We're a four impact organization, as you say, uh, based in the northern coast of Peru. Uh, for this uh, belief and for this purpose, we're improving. Uh, people's um, quality of life um, while conserving and also restoring their natural environment. Um, I think it's important to make that distinction um, 
conservation, of course, is, is great. It's a strategy to use when you're, of course, running out of something and you want to prevent from completely uh, uh, losing it forever. Uh, while restoration actually is uh, turning things around and recovering, uh, of course, um, recuperating the, the, the biodiversity, the environment, and et cetera. No? Um, so um, it's, it's becoming more and more relevant uh, in, in, in the current state of affairs if we can actually um, shift more towards restoration, regeneration um, in particular. So uh, we develop and implement sustainability projects on the ground with marginalized communities. As, as you mentioned, um, we bring together different disciplines, interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. Actually, um, from this combination, uh, you can argue that new fields uh, arise, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Um, and these communities we work with are remote. Sometimes, you know, government uh, presence is uh, scarce. Uh, they endure low or very low socioeconomic um, conditions, and they depend to a large extent on their natural surroundings for subsistence, uh, such as livestock um, herding communities uh, that run livestock in the, in the natural landscape of the dry forest ecosystem that we have here uh, and i can talk a bit more about this uh, particular ecosystem so yeah myself um, as an engineer and turned into a social entrepreneur um, my other colleagues as well coming from other disciplines uh, the social sciences uh, uh, business marketing um, etc um, yeah you need maybe a bit of both of a bit of everything actually and um, as we're also promoting holistic management, um, it's good to have you know, specializations in different fields, but at the same time, it's good to have a general knowledge of the whole of everything that is happening. And, and from there, um, agree on what's the future, what we want the future to be, and then work uh, towards that all together. Super, super. Thanks, Diego. And I, I want to pick up on that 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 um, last piece about visioning later on, because I'm sure people will be interested to 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 understand that. Like, how do you how do you build a common vision? That seems quite a fundamental um, uh, component of of this work at multiple levels, whether it's the COP or or your work in in Peru. So we'll come we'll come back to that for sure. But thanks yeah, for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Great. Well, I also want to give a chance to, to Dan to, to come in here. Um, and Dan, when we talked uh, previously, you know, you had some really interesting points about going back to the definition of this regenerative principle. And I think, you know, that there could be some interesting discussions we have tonight on that, because, you know, the first part is um, there's there's reducing impact and then there's going beyond reducing impact to um, uh, to restoration, and so, so when you when you make that statement, it, then it feels important to understand well, what what do we mean by impact, and how do we how do we assess impact? And I know that in your in your work, you've looked, you have worked with with environmental impact assessment, for example. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that work. And perhaps, you know, as, as you talk about EIA, um, any considerations on how we um, link impact assessment mitigation to actually going beyond to this conversation about regeneration? Uh, sure. I can just check and can everybody hear me okay? I had to change my, um, my, my sound because... My office is in the loft, in, uh, as is the extractor fan, which went on because my wife's cooking dinner. Um, so yeah, um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, I'm a civil and environmental engineer originally, uh, and um, it's interesting hearing Olivia saying that she wants to go into renewable energy because I didn't start in renewable energy. I wanted to, I wanted to go into fecal sludge management. Uh, <laughs> I, I worked overseas in water and sanitation, that sort of thing. And when I, I joined Haskoning, uh, well as going DHV, we're, we're kind of like the Dutch Arab 
uh, we're the biggest and oldest, uh, I think we're just the biggest, we're certainly the oldest civil engineering company in the Netherlands. Um, and I, I kind of fell into environmental impact assessment because I had this background in sustainable development uh, and I'd done this master's in sustainability. And I, I found that uh, you, with an environmental impact assessment, you get, you know, 20 different specialists who are all focused on their one little bit. And I was actually very good at kind of re- talking across all of these things saying, okay, well, if you have an air impact here, then that's going to affect the community over here and, and kind of making these connections. Uh, which is uh, something I think is really important around regeneration. And what I've really learned from our EIA teams and from working with offshore wind developers and things. Um, so to go to the question, I mean, an environmental impact assessment is a is a regulatory requirement for uh, large infrastructure in Europe. Um, anything which is what's called Annex 2 under the EIA directive uh, or in the UK, a, a nationally significant infrastructure project. And you do a screening process. So first of all, you say, you know, what are we going to build? Roughly where are we going to build it? And then you say, you know, what's what's it close to? Uh, how could it potentially have an impact on anything? And, uh, you know, do we need to do a full EIA here? And at, at that point, you, you consult with the re- relevant stakeholders. At, at that point, it's mainly the, the regulatory or statutory stakeholders. Um, and you decide whether you need to do one or not. But it's also, that is the point at which you should be saying, if we build this, is this the best way we could be building it? Could we be doing it in a different way? Could we completely reconsider how we are doing this? Um, and 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 from there, you really need to start to thinking about okay, well, you know, what? Uh, so from a civil engineering perspective, I predominantly worked on uh, both either coastal or riverine flooding uh, or, or offshore wind development. We're, we're we're really strong in sort of the the water's edge, the kind of land to, to water nexus um and so you can be saying things like well you know can we be building do we need to build a hard infrastructure for flood defenses or, or could we be looking up up catchment uh and saying you know can we be reforesting the area can we work with with land managers uh to reduce the flow uh if it's coastal then you know uh depending on where you are you could be saying could we be reintroducing salt marsh here? Could we be re- regenerating the the beaches? Could we be, you know, uh, could we just move people back from the coast? Uh, there are certain. Some of my colleagues have done this in um, Wales. They they basically said, this this beat this village we need to move it, um, and 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 it, and it's that that's the real point at which you want to start understanding. What is it you're actually going to be doing, and, and could you be doing it in a uh, in a manner which is more regenerative than 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 otherwise? You then, once you've figured out what is you you know, you, and this is an iterative process. You, you're never going to just start going, "Hey, I've got everything right. Let's go." Um, you you've got to go through scoping. So you, from that sort of initial screening, you you you've got a fairly good idea of. You know, we'll have impacts on air, we'll have impacts on noise, water, etc. You 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 work all the determinants out, and uh, you go through a, a, a second set of consultation, um, and your methodology for this will be predominantly to say, you know, what is the source of my impact, and the source of your impact is, in construction terms, normally a process. So it's the construction of something or the operation of something. Um, periodically, it's the the physical land take of things or or the uh, the the interference of like a building or or a turbine or something um you know say interfering with your view or with uh with the flight path of a of a of a bird um and, and then you have the the pathway of impact so how is it physically going to affect something uh, and and normally you'd have like an energy effect so noise light uh, that sort of thing you'd have an emission uh, so uh, emission to air, to water, dust, chemicals, et cetera, um, uh, you know, not uh, uh, NOx, um, or, or you'd have land take. So, you know, are, are we going to take some habitat away from something? Are we going to take the farm, uh, you know, the land away from the farmer, et cetera? Um, and then you you have to understand, you know, when what is it affecting? And the sensitivity of that receptor is really important uh, because, in one area, 
a receptor could be completely different. The sensitivity of it could be completely different somewhere, somewhere else. So if you're in a particularly sensitive area, like the, the forest that Diego is working in, they're potentially far more vulnerable and far more sensitive than, than I don't know, the, the, um, the forest of Dean or, or somewhere which is really well established and, and isn't sort of affected. Um, equally, you know, if I did a lot around socioeconomic, so for example, if you're looking at the, the um, labour force in the south of England, where a lot of offshore wind farms are being built, and you're going to bring in thousands of people to our area, uh, that has a completely different sensitivity to the north of Scotland, where there's hardly anybody. And, and so you have to look at the, sort of the context of what it is that you're impacting uh, to understand whether, uh, whether that environment can really absorb and understand, you know, really, really cope with what, what's going on. Um, because then you understand how you're going to mitigate it. And then you can kind of go back to the beginning of saying, well, is there a better way we can mitigate this? Could we just fully avoid this impact? Could we design it in a better way? Could we, uh, could we create benefit out of this? Uh, and then just to make it a bit more complicated, you then have to understand what the value of mitigating it is. So, uh, talking to our, uh, the lead for our, our project um, our, at Bacton called the Sand Engine. And I was asking him about the ecology around there and saying, you know, did you actually improve the ecology? Is there a real sort of ecological benefit? And he said, well, one of the problems was that we were looking at how you reintroduce sand dunes to this area, but the ecology from a natural England point of view wasn't as valuable as other things. And therefore, it then affected how the financing worked and then the clients were like, well, you know, if we don't really need to do it and the, and the, the value of that habitat isn't so high, then, then it's how much harder to finance it. Uh, and so you go through the, all these stages of consultation and understanding between like the, the, the specialists who, who are just so absolutely passionate about what they're doing and the, the communities who are going, well, I don't care, <laughs> just, you know, stop my house flooding and the people with money saying, well, what's the return on my investment? And, and you've, you have to balance these things together to actually create something which could potentially be regenerative. It, it's at a civil, civil infrastructure scale, it's mind-bogglingly complicated. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dan. That's, that's fascinating. And I think, you know, the conversation about scales and um, how we how we value different things at different scales and 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 how we negotiate that between different groups. I think lots of um, discussions about the um, yeah the ecological economics, but also the power dynamics that exist then at those different scales. Uh, very fascinating, and I'm sure we'll we'll pick up more on that um, from all of you. Um, I, I, and I want to hear more about the sand engine as well um, as we go forward. So um, I'm going to I'm going to come back uh, to to Olivia now. And um, Olivia, you you kind of uh, piqued my interest when you know talking about these different areas you'd worked in, biofuels. Um, I know you work with waste management, um, and then you mentioned at the end there uh, that you'd worked with with Lush. Which, as I understand it, is a um, a commercial a commercial company um, with a with a kind of um, very specific um, environmental mission. And so I wondered if you could just say a bit, a little bit more about that. How does a commercial uh, company set up with that with that kind of ethical stance? And um, and and how, how did your engineering skills fit into that? What were you what were you actually doing to help them um, change their their impact? Oh yeah, um, so I think it's difficult for a commercial company to set out with those principles. And I think what so Lush is a British cosmetics company that's known for making bath bombs, um, which are like things that fizz in your bath water. So, um, and what the Lush was set up in the mid 90s and its core ethical um, requirement was to um, uh, fighting against animal testing. So that was the core ethical driver behind it at the beginning. And then it added and grew from there. Um, and uh, regeneration and sustainability was always part of that, but it became more formalized um, as the company grew. And it started as a business within someone's kitchen. Um, 
and and grew into a global company with last when I left it was something like a billion turnover so the reason that it could work for lush was because it was embedded from the beginning um so you're not trying to add something on but it was still difficult um because as it grew um those the pressures of capitalism so having to make money um yeah and so we learned about models like donut economics, which is great to put in place for us personally as a company, but because the rest of, you know, um, the people that we interact with, our, our clients, our suppliers might not be modeling things the same way. It's hard to um, live by those principles and ethics in a, in a silo, you, you, which you're not. Um, so you're, you can, and part of what Lush very much was trying to do was influence its supply chain um to have the same standards as as they did but it's it's not easy to do um so for me i was brought in to look at the aroma chemicals so they're the smelly synthetic fragrance ingredients um so lush uses a lot of natural ingredients and it got to know its natural ingredients very well and do and do that very well um but didn't know so much about its synthetics. Um, so I was brought in to understand more of what that is, to see if the decisions they made 25 years ago still stacked up um, and to see what new innovation there was. So um, I was sourcing materials, but also seeing if there was new ways to do things. So from that, um, I became really interested in fermenting things, which is what led me to my new, next job in the circular economy because of making things from waste. Um, so. Uh, I created an ingredient, so which so that was using my engineering skills. So, in case you don't know, you can't get the smell of a banana naturally, um, apart from from a banana, obviously. <laughs> so, if you're smelling banana and it's not from a banana, um, it's a synthetic ingredient. It's isoamyl acetate and butyrate, which uh, most aroma chemicals are derived from fossil fuels, so crude oil, and that doesn't, you know, the, those processes don't tick all of Lush's boxes. It was how do you remove yourself from that, which is impossible in a lot of ways, but we can do it in token pieces. Um, so I was trying to create a banana smell. So I looked at things like um, CO2 extraction um, and, and lots of other processes and actually ended up being the simplest thing that worked. So I just made um, uh, like a tincture. Uh, so I was just soaking banana peel in various different things, ethanol, um, glycerin and bits like that to see what I could extract so that was a really simple thing so that was because we had we use bananas to make our face masks so we had lots of banana peel left over and composting is great but there is such a thing as too much of a good thing and there's some not so nice stuff that comes out of banana peel so if you're composting banana peels on a mass scale be careful um so that was one of the things that I made and then I just got so interested in this idea of waste not being waste being a resource um and from there I took on another ingredient which is dipropylene glycol which is used in a lot of fragrances to um make so you, when you're mixing fragrance ingredients together especially with natural ingredients there's a lot of different viscosities happening so dpg is used um to to mix them together um so I we again lush has a lot of organic waste so I was looking to see if we could ferment that to make a DPG um, and I didn't have all the technical skill to be able to do that and also the resource um, so I partnered with an American company to do that research and see if we could scale up so I started touching much more on bioengineering and things like that to see if it's possible and we had proof of concept um, when I left and it was it was scale up time to see if that was possible when I left Lush so that was really cool and then I worked with other companies um, so ethanol there's lots of different ways you can make ethanol so I was just shifting suppliers to see that you can have it from crude oil you can um ferment it from you can have it from wheat um but that can be grown in various different ways so I was looking back kind of beyond the chemical engineering process and looking at the agriculture because just because it's a natural ingredient that supplies a process um the gut reaction is to say oh that must be better um but agriculture has on a mass scale has its problems as well so it was it was looking at those things um, and I ended up partnering with a company in Brazil um, that are uh, make ethanol from sugarcane which might feel like a red flag with Brazil and sugarcane but it was um, a regenerative um, plot 
um, and it was a fully circular process. So it was using all the different parts that came off um, growing um, and it supplied energy to local environments and it did lots of other cool things. Um, so yeah, I, that was a very long winded answer. And I hope it, it said what I needed to. I, I think, and more, and looking at the chat, you're inspiring um, other engineers to, to go back to school and do chemical engineering now. So um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, the, this, it's so fascinating, uh, this question of the kind of the boundaries that we operate within and our areas of influence. And I think that will, that's probably a frustration, but also the fundamental challenge for us as, uh, as engineers engineers as to to how we we navigate and, and have influence um you know beyond the red line um in a kind of civil engineering um term but uh but fascinating to see how you've managed to kind of reach back through the supply chain there um really 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 great cool so um i'm, I'm going to turn to you diego and um we're going to talk uh, about a very specific ecosystem in in South America, um, which is the tropical dry forest on the north coast of Peru, which is where you, you all have been working, as, as you've said. Um, so yeah, I just I just wanted you to delve into a bit more detail about, you know, what what your approaches have been there. Um, and what what's been important for for um, for Ecoswell to actually um, get this work off the ground and, and build this coalition of stakeholders around a common vision of regeneration. Uh huh. Exactly. So yeah, the um, the tropical or equatorial dry forest, or even more particular, neotropical dry forest. It's a very unique um, ecosystem or biome. In particular, the Tumbician area, which uh, comprises the northwest of Peru and the west of Ecuador, um, um, a dry or seasonally dry, arid, even hyper arid sometimes um, environment here. So there are high levels of adaptations by plants and animals to this uh, aridity. And this has led to high levels, of course, of, of biodiversity and um, endemisms. So that means we have a wide variety of uh, species of flora and, and fauna, but also a lot of those are endemic. They are only found here in the Tunisian area and uh, nowhere else in the world. Um, this is especially relevant, for example, for uh, uh, bird watchers or, or bird lovers, people that, that like birds, and, and we have a lot of uh, endemic birds here. So an interesting um, asset or opportunity there for um, from ecotourism. Um, we, we need to understand that uh, biodiversity is a, is a basis of um, development, uh, is a basis for natural resources, and the people that live in such places, well, they, they should be, they have to be the, the stewards of this uh, unique biodiversity, because otherwise, who else uh, is going to actually take that on, right? Um, everyone is, is, is trying to do their thing in their own uh, part of the world, right? Um, so we were beginning to work uh, recently, uh, and this, this is work that uh, has been sparked uh, in the last uh, year or so, um, uh, collaborating with the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, in the UK. Um, I was selected as, as one of their um, 13 um, World uh, Frontiers Champions from their Frontiers of Development program. Um, working to build networks and collaborations for addressing um, global challenges at a local level. So uh, we started uh, work now in the, with the communities in El Angolo. This is a, a game reserve, um, an official um, natural protected area by the government of Peru here in the, in the Northwest of, of Peru. And they are allowing this community to go into the protected area to grace because of their traditional um, existence there. So um, of course they, they can go in with their livestock and they, they, they have to do it or they should be doing it in a, in a sustainable way, right? Using the, the resources of the protected area um, sustainably. 
So this this is quite a, a suitable place uh, to work in collaboration uh, with government entities, with community uh, grassroots organizations, um, other levels of local government or um, different ministries like um, agriculture, environment, um, and to actually recover and restore this um, this ecosystem, which is is, is quite a turning to. To, to a severe degradation, um, while at the same time improving the, um, the local productivity of, of these people and, and their socioeconomic conditions. So um, the livestock, the land, and, and the community working it, they are already there. Um, so it is a matter of um, organizing it better, planning it better, planning the grazing under holistic management to if, if, if we do that right, we can actually change from um, a current situation of that, that is leading to overgrazing, uh, desertification, lowering um, um, levels of, of the water table, uh, soil erosion, um, biodiversity loss, um, uh, even flooding, etc., and low productivity levels. We can go from all of that just through a better um, planning process and um, decision-making framework under um, holistic management. And we can go to the opposite, no? to reverse the certification, to having um, permanent pastures, permanent ground cover. That, of course, uh, prevents soil erosion, um, increases uh, water tables. The soil is actually turning into a sponge for water, for carbon, um, it's holding more life, uh, more microbiology. Um, it, it, it turns from a barren desert to actually having a soil food web. Um, fertility, of course, improves. And of course, you get more productivity. And you're bringing back biodiversity and improving, uh, of course, the, the socioeconomic conditions all, all around. So um, a previous important step before trying to, to hit the ground and, and do this work, um, of course, is um, um, a, a building consensus process before all of that. And you need all decision makers involved. Uh, this, this relates a lot to what uh, Dan was saying, right? And, and you really need to identify all those decision makers, of course, everyone who has uh, power to make decisions over that place, that, that hole that you're defining uh, for your area of work, um, all the stakeholders, and they need to convene on what is their desired quality of life uh, for the future in this hole. Um, how do they want their lives to be? Um, and how their life support system, which is their natural surroundings, their environment, how that and, and, and their behaviors as, as humans, how that needs to be in the future to allow for that uh, desired quality of life um, to come about. So um, regeneration, as, as, as we understand it, um, it means achieving this desired quality of life in your given context. It means building soil, restoring the ecosystem, reversing the certification, and climate change um, by improving basic uh, ecosystem processes such as the water cycle, the carbon cycle, biodiversity dynamics, um, and how um, doing a lot of uh, biomimicry, restoring uh, nature's relationships such as those between animals and soil um, that we may have lost because of um, human impact. Um, especially relevant in arid environments, this is. Um, and doing this through holistic management, um, holistic plant grazing and regenerative agriculture. Uh, the, 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 the pretty thing, the, the thing that I like a lot about all of this is that holistic management is aligning nature with the social and the economic aspects. No? Um, the, the future desired quality of life agreed by all decision makers, and it needs to be simple. It has to fit in one single page. Um, 
is tied to the future of the environment and the future of the people. And that becomes the holistic context. So in the future, whenever we want to make new decisions, um, we, we are usually humans. We are all making decisions either because there is a problem, there is a need or a desire, right? Um, um, Olivia was mentioning uh, engineers were problem solvers. No? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is great. There is a reason to make a decision. But the context uh, in which we make the decision, it cannot just be the problem or the need or the desire. We have to consider the whole, the holistic context. Um, and okay. if we start to do that, not only nature is regenerated, but also societies and economies. So regeneration will lead you from uh, scarcity to abundance, uh, both in resources, also in mindsets. Super. Thanks, Diego. And um, fascinating to hear about that one page vision that you can kind of have there and come back to when there are, when there are conversations down the line. I really like that idea. Great. So we're, we're moving rapidly towards the moment when we should go into breakout rooms. But I, before that, I want to give um, uh, the, the chance to the, uh, the participants to ask any questions and also for, for, for Dan to, to have another word. Um, and maybe, Dan, I'm seeing an interesting question here from Donald in, in the chat about externalities. Uh, did you see that one? Yeah. Would you would you be willing to to respond to that? Give that a crack. Uh, yeah, it's uh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really really hard question to answer. To be perfectly honest, um, yeah. to be to be so so the question, unless everybody else has seen it, is is uh, so I'll be interested to understand how to address externalities that are currently ignored by conventional economics, um, and it's not it's really not a very easy thing to to address because regardless of which type of economic uh environmental economics you use the value that you end up calculating is normally quite inconsequential to the value of the piece of from a civil engineering point of view anyway if you just try and do it on a on a like for like basis if you say okay well you know from an environmental point of view we either we we don't want to plow through this field uh, so we're going to go round it with our road, for example, and the cost of per mile of a road is, you know, or the, 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 the value of the field is X and the cost per mile of a road is going to be 10 X and you need 10 more miles. And, and so it, it never stacks up in that way. Um, so you need to find other ways to relate the externality to things that people care about. Uh, in, in my experience. Um, so you either can, you can do it in a few ways. <laughs> you can, you can do it with a stick um, and you can say, you know, you have to uh, create habitat, for example, of twice the amount if you take habitat away. And so that's a regulation under, uh, uh, under the EU, I uh, think under the Natura regs. Um, and I, it's been copied over into British regs. And I think it's actually, I've not read the Environment Bill, but I believe the Environment Bill is actually intending to strengthen the uh, the role of environmental decision-making in the UK rather than weaken it. That is my hope. Um, so there, there's that sort of uh, element around, you know, you can, you can just regulate somebody to do it. Um, but I think the more effective way is to look at it in a in a holistic manner and to say actually certainly from a risk point of view so certainly from when we've been working in flooding and that sort of thing and, and even in in sort of business development so if you take it from a flooding point of view you can say well you could build a hard barrier here and then you'd have to build another hard barrier in a certain amount of time and, and to be honest with you we don't really know you know because the, the, the risk profile of, of uh, return periods and things is changing due to climate change, it's much harder for us to now understand you know, how big that, that flood barrier needs to be. On the other hand, if you did something like reintroduce, you know, depending on where you are, reintroduce a salt marsh or you know, create a, uh, a, um, a beach renewal system like a sand engine, um, 
then you're working with the natural process as opposed to against the natural process. So you can say, well, it will A, cost you less in the, in the, the first point, and B, uh, probably will work better over the longer term. Unfortunately, the difficulty with that, we were looking at a, a, a second sand. So I, just to be clear, I didn't work on the sand engine in Bacton, uh, but I, did, I was asked to look at the economics of, of it around uh, in another area of the UK. And one of the problems we, we came up with, we have come up against was that the council had a uh, period of time that they had a budget for. It was to the end of their, their, their elected council period. And to build something which is regenerative, you, you, you say, well, it's going to cost you about this much in, in the first year, which is less than your, your hard structure, but you have to maintain it and you have to maintain it indefinitely. Uh, and the council quite often will look at it and go, well, we only have a period of five years, so that's a bit of a risk to us, and we don't really know if it's going to continue. So, so then you have to say, well, you know, could we make it valuable and viable for the community, the, the, the economy around here, to maintain that? Um, so there are some really interesting examples of this. Uh, there's, uh, there's a thing called Deep. It's in the Dornock Firth. Um, where Glen Morangi, the whiskey distiller, so uh, you might know about this, Olivia. One of the dirty secrets of the whiskey industry is they're a dirty industry. They are not nice little twee cottage industries. They are big alcohol factories. They are chemical factories in the most beautiful part of the United Kingdom. And for a long time, they have been pushing chemicals into the water uh, because they could, because they've, they've just grandfathered all their their uh, their licenses and things. And so they've had a lot of pressure and, and they've wanted to do stuff. And Glen Morangi, uh, they were looking at how they could treat all their chemicals. And I can't quite remember how it came about, but um, Harriet Watt said, well, there's actually a native oyster in the dawn at first that was there thousands of years ago and it was fished out. If you reintroduce these, then they will clean the water. Not only that, they, will, they have a higher carrying capacity, so they will clean more of what you're putting in. So if you built a treatment plant, which took your effluent level down to a certain level, the oysters will do the rest of it. And so then it's, then it's, then it's of, for benefit of Glemorangi and the whiskey distillers to maintain that. Um, and, and I think you need to find areas like that. I could go on at length about this. This fascinates me. Um, there are finance companies that are looking at this where they're like putting parks into trusts and then saying, well, this park is, a, is, an, is an area where we could actually create economic value out of it. So then they invite people in to start saying, well, how could we use this for environmental benefit? How can we turn this into a productive system? Um, yeah, there, there's, and, and I think that's the real way of doing it is to, to not look at it from a point of view of, this is something we need to protect and somebody needs to pay for it. Say, no, no, this is a system. It provides us value. How do we get the most value out of it? How does, how does everybody benefit from it? Because all of a sudden you then turn around from something where you're saying, oh god i've got to like save the trees to something like where you're saying wow if i if we maintain these trees then, then my house doesn't get flooded or you know uh my 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 crop yield goes up or you know um that that is in my opinion the way to to do it brilliant thanks so much dan fascinating example and um yeah the politics and economics of of sustainability and negotiation um <laughs> And sustainable whiskey, I, I support that. Uh, 100%. <laughs> it's not sustainable yet. But they are <laughs> I, sustainable I whiskey goal. people are actually doing pretty well. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of work. Yeah, very interesting. Great. So um, we're going to go in now into into breakouts, and we'll, we'll have a chance to to, to chat more. Um, just before we do that, just I just wanted to say if, ask if there's any burning questions from from the audience I wanted to uh, ask now. Um, feel free to unmute and speak up. Equally, we can we can talk more in uh, the breakouts. Um, so, um, yep, not seeing any immediate questions. So we can keep them rolling in in the chat as well. Um, just uh, some notes on the breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to go into rooms of around uh, four, five, six people, and Millie. Thanks. Has put the question into the into the chat here. What actions can we all take forward to embed regenerative practices in our day to day work? 
Um, and it would be awesome if 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 one person from each group could uh, um, nominate themselves or put themselves forward to to take a few notes, and then at the end of the session to put those those quick notes into the chat box, so we have a record of what what everyone said. Um, if if you need any help with the discussion. Um, or facilitation, then there's an ask for help button and the EWB uh, wonder crew will, will come in and, and, and help. And uh, yeah, just um, let's have a good chat and make sure everyone's got a chance to, to talk and share their experiences. And um, thanks for the good conversation so far to the panelists. There was so more I wanted to ask you all about, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll have more time to talk. And I think with that, uh, Millie, if you're in control of the breakout rooms, I think we can we can move into those rooms. Okay, I'm seeing um, to the main room. Are we are we all back in, Millie? As far as you can see, Diego's coming in here. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like everyone's back. Yeah, fab. Great. Um, so yeah, I, I hope you all had good conversations. Uh, it was very interesting to listen into the group that um, I was in with Joe and Stephen. Um, and um, we have we have just nine minutes until we close the session, and we want to finish up on time so you all can get on with your evenings and days um it would be great to get some feedback from from the sessions so if if people did take notes if there's a rapporteur from from the each of the groups it would be great to put those into uh into the chat and i think we have a moment um if if anyone from any of the groups or any of the rapporteurs would like to um, unmute and, and tell us a little bit about um, what they discussed, if there were any revelations or um, you figured out what this regenerative principle is all about, that would be great to, to, uh, to hear. Uh, yeah, uh, so would anyone like to, to tell us a bit more about what they talked about in their group? I'm seeing a few people still kind of connecting in. Um, oh, yeah, I see a hand up. Donald, welcome. Uh, thank you. Yes, a really, really interesting discussion there with uh, Budila, who's actually in Sri Lanka, so it's late at night for him. Uh, and also Eleanor, and we were joined by Diego. And just a couple of things to say. So an interesting conversation about the interconnectedness of the Sustainable Development Goals. But by going in a blinkered way after one objective, you can actually fail on all the others. So just getting too focused on, on carbon might cause problems elsewhere. And a second kind of uh, uh, exhortation, I guess, from Diego to be, avoid being overwhelmed by, uh, and, uh, by all of the problems and becoming reductionist. And a real encouragement as we think about regenerative to think about the bigger picture. Um, and certainly uh, both Eleanor and uh, Budila were talking about uh, education, professional registration, uh, practical examples of regenerative in action being important to, to build our our fluency and a plug actually from uh, I think Diego on uh, for the renewable principle on a piece of work done by Alan Savory. Apparently, there's a book called Holistic Management. There's also a TED talk which I've just looked up. So, if anyone's kind of looking to improve their fluency, their understanding of this, that's a great starting point. I'll stick it in the uh, in the in the, connection, in the in the chat. So thank you. Super brilliant uh, summary of, of a good conversation, Donald. Thanks for that. And yeah, it would be great to get the the links as well. Um, great. Anyone, anyone else uh, interested to share anything from their conversations? Uh, John, I see a hand up. Uh, would welcome to the conversation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no, we, we had a really uh, interesting chat with, with uh, Tom uh, uh, Camagello. Uh, Camagello down in South Africa, uh, and so 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 joining us similar time zone, but but, but a few thousand miles away. Um, and what we were talking about is what what um, 
he had learned by participating in the Engineers Without Borders design challenge, um, which was uh, looking at uh, providing a water solution in Peru. Um, but but the lesson that, 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 that he sort of taken away with that was looking at the solutions that were presented as a part of the, the, the competition and the challenge um, actually could apply to his, his home village back in South Africa. Uh, and I think sort of I was taking my perspective on it, having done some work in the past uh, in, in certain countries where um, the, the, the idealized solution that we all get taught, and you know, I got taught a civil engineering degree and got taught idealized solutions. We always start with the statement, let us assume. And, and of course, actually, let us assume is not necessarily a helpful way of looking at things because it allows you to ignore certain factors. So our, our key, key learning was take, to, to take, take the learning, but actually make it real. And, and, and really bring it home to the practicalities and the realities of what you're dealing with and don't just assume. So that was our key lesson. Brilliant, John. Thanks so, so much for that. That's, um, that's uh, a, again, a really, really useful summary. And yeah, welcome everyone to, to, to put their um, further notes in the chat and we'll, we'll gather up all these notes because there's some, some great comments and links in here as well. So I think we're we're moving towards uh, a conclusion, and I there's a couple of notes that um, I want to share um, on behalf of EWB. Um, I mean, first of all, I just want to also say thanks so much to um, the the audience, uh, the audience, and and the panelists. You all have been great. It's been super to meet. Um, meet Olivia, um, Diego and, and talk more with, with Dan. And I think, I hope that you all have seen how, um, yeah, how uh, um, the, the work that they're doing at, at these different scales and in these different places is, uh, is certainly um, inspiring. And they're, um, to me, they're, um, yeah, examples of, of folk who are really kind of connecting the dots and, um, becoming the, the T-shaped engineers or recovering T-shaped engineers um, that are kind of have the technical depth um, to put these things together, but also reaching out across different disciplines and, and conversations. Um, you know, and I, I think we've heard um, how significant the challenges we have in front of us are, but yeah, with, with this panel and with you all, um, I think we're all trying to mobilize the principles that EWB have put forward. Um, and, um, you know, I, I remember from in my own uh, education, I remember I had a professor who always used to say, um, well, why are these conservationists worried about um, uh, ecosystems? We'll just design new ecosystems. And it, it was kind of, laughable at the time, but it, it, it's a fundamentally, um, you know, disturbing idea that, 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 that we can kind of replace um, or, um, or, or build um, uh, life systems uh, to replace the, the, the ones that we have. It's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not possible. And so we have to um, understand as engineers how we kind of uh, navigate and relate to those those natural systems, and I think part of that, you know, going back to education, is is transforming the way. First of all, how engineering is taught, um, as well as how it's practiced. And I know from having looked at the strategy of EWB, it's that kind of radical transformation they've got at the heart of the strategy. So, um, a plug to you all to have a look at that if you haven't already. Um, and anyone who's not a member of EWB UK then please, uh, please join. Um, this is the final panel of this series of constructive conversations. The other ones are, are posted on the website. I recommend checking them out as well. They all kind of fit together quite neatly, I think. Um, but there will be a new series next year. And um, we are also excited to announce that there will be a professional design challenge um, coming next year called Reshaping Engineering. 
Um, and that's kind of building on the previous uh, design challenges which have run uh, at the university level. I'm super excited to find out more about what that is. Um, it's a member only event. So uh, for those who are members, you'll get details about that soon. Uh, we have um, a, a feedback poll, um, which I think will have come round. Um, so do, um, do fill that in and give us some, some feedback on the conversation um, as you see it. And I think uh, we're just coming up to the hour. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave uh, a minute for us to fill that in. But yeah, I'll just say thanks again to, to Olivia, Dan, Diego, and all of you who've joined this evening. Um, I, for me, it's been a good conversation and I hope it's been uh, interesting to everyone who's joined. Thanks so much and uh, have a good night, day, everyone.